Dude, you, that's wrong. Thank you so much. As I'm waiting for uh, my system to boot up here and get everything functioning, and I will plug it in and get you on the screen here. Um, I, I always ask this question when I, when I do the lecture here, so I'll ask you guys this question now. Um, how many people in this audience, by a show of hands, um, have actually written a computer virus in the past? Raise your hand. Cool. All right, now how many federal officers are actually making track of the guys who just raised their hand? Raise your hands. <laughs> Thanks. All right, now how many hackers are now keeping track of the federal officers? <laughs> Thanks. You're late. Do we have any locals? Anybody here live for, in Vegas? Okay, so this heat is not bothering you at all. <laughs> I know. I just moved to Vegas here uh, three, three months ago, and uh, I'm still trying to get used to this. How long have you been here? 15 years? You know the freeway actually leaves the town. You know that, right? Okay, just, just want to make sure you knew that. I found that out by accident. I got lost, wrapped around, and I was out of town. I was like, wow. <laughs> so that would mean that everybody else is from out of town. That's pretty much a good guess. Yep. All right, who here is from out of town? Yeah, raise your hands. Woo, yeah. I also like to point out that um, of all the years I've been coming to DEF CON, I finally got my wife, Stacy, to come out to DEF CON with me. You know? So she is a con virgin here. All right, gentlemen, I'd like to point out wife Stacy. Yes. Oh, I am so changing operating systems. All right, who can guess what operating system I'm using? BSD, that's one of them. Which really sucks is I wrote this pres presentation on, you know, PowerPoint. I bumped my head, give me a break. Uh, hey, wow, it looks like it's actually fucking finished. It's yeah, it's infected with Tri-State, yeah. Bastard. I know where you're sitting. Okay. Your slides. All right. Now you excuse me. We're, we're actually going to start this now. I'd like to again thank you coming out to uh, my lecture. I think better when I'm m moving, so <laughs> I'm going to be pacing back a lot. So the camera guy's going you bastard. All right. How many people have actually seen my talk before? Raise your hand. Thank you. I have four four friends. Thanks. <laughs> All my friends, oh yeah, I'll make your talk, yeah. This is uh, the introduction to computer viruses. This is where we're gonna talk about the different types of uh, basic viruses that, that are out there in the, in the world. Um, how they actually work, how they infect the systems, how to remove several of them, and we'll talk a little bit about how to actually protect yourself in the past, in the future. Um, this will be online. This was not in the CD because uh, as many times as I sent, hey, am I speaking or not, um, <laughs> my emails got lost. <laughs> Finally, I got this phone call a week ago from Noid. Dude, how come we haven't heard from you? I was like, hello. Yeah, email, gotta love it. So this is not on the uh, DEF CON CD. Um, I will be giving a copy of this to Noid to put on the DEF CON website. Next Gen Professional Services, uh, I'm a uh, owner in the, in the corporation. We do uh, IT stuff. This is not a sales pitch. My name, email address uh, at NextGen, and personal email addresses at below, and my website. Excuse the website, hasn't been updated in a while. Will be, though. 
Great. Uh, my, this will be on my website and probably also be on the DEF CON site. Okay. I'm used to being able to actually see this shit, so let me see here. What's covered in this talk? Uh, what is the malicious code? We'll talk about boot sectors, the multi power ties, file infectors, macros, Trojan horses, fakes, VBS scripts, hostile code, computer viruses in the future. Definition of mal uh, malicious code, malware. Any program or script written specifically to execute on behalf of the user without the user's permission or knowledge, violate worms and Trojans. Horses are all examples of malicious code. So anything, all right, stop saying Windows. <laughs> By definition, maybe. But you paid for it. Unless you were that smart gal, Chris, who actually came back with her system and handed them back the unused uh, C uh, CDs and said, I want the money back on this because I don't agree to the license agreement. That was clever. What is a virus? A parasitic self-replicating code that attaches itself to a host. Hosts can be floppy boot records, master boot records, partition boot records, DOS boot sectors, binary files, and data files. Docs, you know, XLS, PPTs, comms, yada, yada, yada. Um, viruses now are actually becoming a little bit more prominent in actually infecting a lot more things. Uh, you guys read about the JPEG virus, right? Raise your hand. This is audience participation, goddammit. Raise your hand. All right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I'll wake your asses up yet. I know it's hot. Give me a break. Um, the viruses are really expanding out now. A lot of people are getting a little bit more clever. Y well, let me back up. So now I'm above. All right. One of the issues with uh, the computer viruses are is in the past, you used to have to actually have coding skills to actually write a freaking virus. Back when I was really in, into viruses and working for an unnamed uh, antivirus company, McAfee, um, we, we were getting on an average of about two to 300 viruses a month, brand new, never before seen. Most of these would not go into the DAT files because there were viruses sent to us by the virus creators going, hey, try to figure this one out. And we go, yeah, whatever. You know, um, but back then, the whole key for virus writers was, hey, how small can we get this and how much damage could we possibly do? You know, you're seeing viruses out there like 9 and 10K, you know, all written in machine code, really, really well written. These guys were actually, I mean, as much as I dislike the concept of actually going out there and purposely destroying other people's lives and destroying their systems or I'm working and destroying uh, small companies, not that I'm bitter about it, uh, these guys actually knew what they were doing. My mother now can write a VBS script. What the fuck? And now you got, the, you got these guys who are like writing things like the I love you virus and going, hey, I'm elite. I'm going, no, you're a script kitty with no morals, no concepts, no clue. But you can write a VBS script. Anybody can write a VBS script. It doesn't mean you're a virus writer. But now these guys are sitting there going, you know what we'll do is we'll take scripts written by hackers and we'll incorporate them in worms and viruses and see if we can just spread the chaos. And it's becoming more prominent. Now, I don't know what Brainiac thought it was a good idea to put in, like, you know, coding capabilities into applications like Word and Excel, giving people the applications like, hey, let's totally screw with people. The guy should be thumped in the head, but that's just me. Um, when we give people the capabilities to actually create malicious code, we're going to see a lot of people without concepts trying this stuff out. It's not hard anymore. And because it's not hard, we're going to see more and more dangerous things out here in the future. What is a worm? Anybody fish? Just me. OK. Hey, a fisherman. Cool. It's all about bass, dude. It's all about bass. All right. <laughs> what is a worm? Self-replicating, self-contained program or code that is not parasitic. Worms do not infect master boot records, boot sectors, binary files, and macros. They do not. Yet. Now, if you read the RFCs, who can tell me the, the RFC that covers worms and viruses? What's the number? Anybody? Yeah, I don't remember either. Who the fuck reads RFCs and memorizes the number? By the RFC definition of a worm, this is the RFC definition of a worm. 
It separates it from a virus. But now we have worms out there who are becoming parasitic. Can someone name me one? Raise your hand. Anybody? Code red, sorta. Nimda. Yeah, because it actually infects executables. So is Nimda a worm or a virus or a hybrid? It's a hybrid. Who thinks it's a hybrid? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's just a worm? Raise your hand. Bloody purist. Who thinks it's a virus? Who's only here because they wanted to take a nap? <laughs> Thank you. Marty, pay attention. <laughs> Boot sector viruses, how they work, what to look for, ways to remove them. Boot sectors, the MBRs divide into three parts, the code, the fat partition information, the marker, 55AA. The virus first copies the hard code, uh, the, the boot code, on the drive to a different sector of the media, and then copies its code over to the boot code, uh, over the boot code. The end of the virus code then prompts to the new sector. Um, the old-fashioned boot sector viruses where you sit there and say, let's grab this code, we'll move it to like sector 7, 8, 9, 12, 17, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say, whatever boot code's there, we're just going to co you know, copy over it, and then what we're going to do is we're going to put a pointer to where the uh, sector is and let the machine boot normally. Now, the boot code is that part of your system that says syntax error, you know, crap like that. It's all hard-coded. So this loads the virus into memory. Now, who has an idea why they want to look for multiple sectors instead of just one? Raise your hand. Anybody? What? Back up? Yes and no. Anybody? Bigger? No. The reason why is, is it allows for multi-infections. If your drive is already infected with New York boot, and Monkey wants to kick in, and it's looking for the same sectors, it's going to first check and say, hey, there's actually code there. We'll just go to the next sector. Hey, there's code there too. Let's go to this next sector. There's nothing there. We'll infect over this. And what it'll do is it'll start putting the markers over there to the other sides, so it now allows for multi-infections of a boot, uh, a boot sector. So if you think you have a boot sector virus, and you run an antivirus product by running like a clean, you know, clean boot disk or a clean boot CD, and it finds a boot sector virus, run it again. Several times I've actually gone to uh, people's sites and, oh man, my whole system's all screwed up. And I'll run an antivirus product and boom, hey, there's a boot sector virus. And then I'll run it again and, hey, there's a different one. Then I'll run it again. And, hey, there's a third different one. Because it'll just kind of start following the tracks and go through. It becomes really, really monotonous. But still kind of clever. The fat partition info of the MBR holds the data and the partition info of the disk. Some viruses encrypt this info, making it impossible to retrieve your data if you remove the virus incorrectly. The monkey is such a virus. Has anyone here been infected with monkey B in their past? For the new people, this was a better written virus. You know, the young kids are like, what's a boot sector virus? Anybody? Monkey? Okay. How much of a pain in the ass was it to get rid of monkey? Mando. None. You refer me to the hard drive. <laughs> now, what'd you do? A special program. McAfee actually had a thing called the monkey remover. Their antivirus product itself wouldn't remove the virus. You actually had to have the monkey re remover. What the monkey did is it replaced the code up here, but it encrypted the fat partition information. Well, by encrypting the fat partition information, if monkey wasn't loaded, you never saw your directory structure. It was gone. So, and it, was and it encrypted itself. So what the monkey remover would do is it would actually create a simulator type situation where it would actually say, hey, I'm going to infect a floppy disk. And the monkey goes, oh, cool. And it would start unencrypting itself. And then it would open up the encryption key. And the moment it saw the encryption key, it would stop in its tracks, use the encryption key to encrypt your uh, fat partition information, and then it would remove the virus. It's actually very clever. The 55AA is the marker that, that identifies the part of the boot sector. So, what? Uh, 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, he's, he's, it basically it catch the. Uh, I thought you were talking. My fly was open. <laughs> he said, "Catch, catch the virus with its pants down." I was like, "Am I what here?" Okay. Yeah. Basically, what it would do is it, it would actually catch the virus with its pants down, N not this virus, that virus, because my pants are up. All right. <laughs> oh, it's going to be one of those years again, isn't it? All right. What to look for? Um, before we go into what to look for, I want to discuss one of the things about the monkey virus. Um, one of the ways to actually remove a boot sector virus is to use a very simple DOS command, which is uh, F disk slash, not just F disk by itself, because that will really remove the virus, but you know, it's F disk slash MBR. Who's used that command? Oh, you guys rock. Cool. I don't need to talk. F disk slash MBR, for those of you who have never used the command in newbies, um, or, you know, People who are like spouses or, you know, and that doesn't count just girls. I know a lot of girls here who brought their boyfriends like, I don't have a clue. <laughs> you know? What it does is it sits there and says, I don't care what code's over on the uh, MBR. Just replace it. Brand new code. It's, in, it, it, it's corrupted. Boom. Now, the problem with monkey is, is if you use uh, f -disk class MBR, it's like, boom, new code. The virus is gone. And then you boot up and it's like nothing there. <laughs> no data, no drive, no nothing. And it's like, well... Now we'll just go back to the F disk portion of the show. No, because it changes the key. If you could do that, then you could remove it easily because it'd be the same key. His question was, is, can you reinfect with the monkey virus to actually recover the data? And it's like, well, no, <laughs> doesn't quite work. All right, what to look for? Go back. I wasn't there. <laughs> Look for copies of the code on different sectors like 3, 7, 9, etc. Look for changes in memory usage. You know, if you're like, wasn't using a lot of memory, wake up. <laughs> if you're not using a lot of memory and all of a sudden you're peaking, that's usually an issue. Stop saying Windows. All right, look for a strange behavior in the OS. No jokes, we're not, we are dealing with Windows. Ah, Windows. That's a whole new section. Ways to remove them, F slash F, uh, F disk slash MBR. Copy the O code from the sector it was moved to and put it back. You can use like uh, semantics, uh, uh, disk utilities to do that. And you can actually view your uh, sectors. Um, one of the things I would often do to see if I was infected by a boot sector virus is I would use disk editor and I would just go through the different sectors. These sectors are not commonly used by any programs, so there should not be anything there. If you see something there, you have a problem. Um, now, not necessarily, though, because you have to keep in mind that if you're using an antivirus product, it will remove the virus, but it won't clean the sector. Thanks, Dad. I listened to your talk. <laughs> so what you'll do is you'll take it like a disk editor. You'll go uh, down the row, try to find the different types you know, of sectors. I'd go maybe about 25. If I didn't see anything, we're cool. Now, if I do know I have a virus and I see a sector like on something 9, I can copy that code, because that's my original boot sector code, and just copy it back over. And that gets rid of the virus. Antivirus software is a given. But the problem with antivirus software, the weakest link in antivirus software is, anybody? The user. You are the weakest link of your antivirus product. How many people here have not updated their antivirus product this week? Raise your hand and be honest. I haven't because I haven't been home. Yeah, today's a new week. How many people have not updated their antivirus product in over a month? How many people are not sure how to update their antivirus product? My, my wife, yeah. That's why hers is automated. <laughs> You know how embarrassing it is when my wife calls me, I have a virus. <laughs> no, you thought you did, though. <laughs> I think I have a virus. It's like, you can't. This is bad for my reputation. You're not allowed. Reboot. <laughs> you know what? You don't have that system anymore. Just bury it in the backyard. Nobody will ever see it. <laughs> I'll buy you a new one. Um, I've done audits all over the country, and one of the first things I do is I look at the antivirus products, and I look at the DAT files. And I was at an... Uh, ISP in San Francisco, and we're doing a security audit, except for the fact that everything else was blowing chunks, like, you know, their server room had this big, huge window with the IP addresses <laughs> to the outside world marked on every machine and the machine name, which they got, 
No, it's not them. I, I won't say who it is because they're not in business anymore. Um, seriously, yeah. I never got my check either, bastards. Um, I went and checked their primary dial-in server with their bank of modems. <laughs> their modem phone numbers were in the phone book. Not a joke. I was serious. I sat there and said, what are all these phone numbers in the phone book under your name? And they said, oh, those are our modems. I went, ah! <laughs> and then I went home and checked. Um, but I checked their antivirus files. The primary server, the DAT files, hadn't been updated in two and a half years. The version of antivirus product they're using, the engine, was outdated. You couldn't even get updates for it. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. No. All right. I wasn't done. I didn't do that yet. Okay. Note, the first two will not work with some viruses. In fact, may foobar your whole system, a.k.a. monkey. Yes. Yeah, his question is, are people still putting out boot sector viruses? Yes. Why? <laughs> the reason why is because boot sector viruses actually take skill to write. So the hard-coded virus writers are actually still working with them because it's a lot more fun if you can actually infect an NT system with a boot sector virus. Okay, now here's the audience participation part again. With a show of hands, you know, we'll raise one hand for true, and then I'll say, who thinks it's false? And we'll raise hands again. True or false? It is impossible to infect an NT workstation server, whatever, that is formatted NTFS with a boot sector virus. Who thinks it's true? Raise your hand. And don't not raise your hand because you're not sure or you think it's a trick question. Who thinks it's impossible? Raise your hand. Nobody. Who thinks that is completely and utterly possible to infect a boot sector, uh, an NT workstation or whatever that's formatted with NTFS with a boot sector virus? Raise your hand if you think it's possible. Okay. All those who raised your hands, how? If I have a floppy disk with, that's infected with a boot sector virus, and I turn on, and I have my machine on, and I put that in the disk, will it infect the system? No, it's impossible. It's impossible doing that way. The reason why is NTFS doesn't show up as a drive with a boot sector virus. I am so not here. <laughs> What happens is the boot sector virus will look to try to infect this drive. Well, NTFS is not a DOS partition drive. So it sees no hard drive can infect. If I take a boot sector virus boot disk, you know, DOS boot disk, Windows 95, whatever, put it in the drive, I boot it up, it sees no drive, cannot infect. Trick question, it's possible. And what you need to do is you need to create an NT boot disk with a DOS formatted disk. Not an NTFS formatted disk, but a DOS formatted disk. And the reason why is because if it's an NTFS uh, formatted disk, you can't infect that disk with a boot sector virus. So what you end up doing is you get your you know, NT boot loaders and all the other uh, required files, and you have a FAT32 disk. And then you take that disk. that's That's Francesca, by the way. <laughs> you take this disk, you go to a system that's actually infected with the boot sector virus, you put the disk in, and being that it's a DOS-infected disk, it will actually infect that. A boot sector virus, if you look at the disk, will infect that disk instantaneously. You just do a directory. You can go A colon, instant infected. You can always tell when you're being infected because it goes, D <coughs> and you're like, that didn't sound good. That, that's one of the keyers. No, no, um, not really, no. Just hit clear. Thank you. Oh, repeat the question. I was mentioning that uh, Sys Internals and other companies, they have uh, NTFS drive mounting tools that are used under DOS, and I wondered if anybody had tried to reap that technology and incorporate it into a virus. No, because this is easier to do, and, and you wouldn't incorporate it so much into the virus because 
it really kind of depends on how your system's set up regardless. Uh, so I actually was at a job interview and I was at the, asked that question and I said, sure, it's possible. And he goes, nah, it's not possible. No one's ever gotten that right. I said, well, I bet you I could do it. And he says, if you can do it, you get the job. And I said, okay, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I came back tomorrow with a disc. And he goes, I said, this is infected with New York boot. And I said, I bet you I can infect your system. And he goes, okay. I said, now, do you need any of the information on this system? <laughs> Have you backed up this system? He goes, this was his workstation at his desk. He goes, no. I said, well, do you have another system I can try this on? He goes, I think this is going to screw up you. He goes, no, it's impossible. You can't. He firmly believed it was impossible. I said, okay, so if I screw up everything on that drive, if this infects and your system's blown away, I still get the job, right? And I won't be the janitor, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay. And I put the disk in the drive. I booted up the system. Grind, grind, grind. He's like, and then all of a sudden, like you know, nothing happens on the on on the screen, and I and I pop out my disc and I press the reset button, and um, he goes, "Told you." I said, "Pow!" Big blue system trashed, which is the key with the problem with the boot sectors on an NTFS partition. It doesn't act like a normal virus. It just says format something because it's gone. <laughs> it's like, sorry, dude. Game over. Thanks for playing. And uh, I, I got the job. <laughs> I only had to empty his garbage for a week, but I got the job. And he wasn't happy. He was like, how the hell did you do that? And I told him what I did. And he's like, well, I never thought of that. I said, well, that's why you hired me. All right, the types of boot sector viruses we have stealth, polymorphic, encrypting, and any combination of these. Some of the more fancy viruses will use all three sequences. Stealth boot sector viruses. A stealth virus hides in upper memory and it helps hide the virus from virus detectors. You can have an antivirus product running on your system and it will not see a, a, a well done vi uh, stealth virus. Because the stealth viruses, you know, the antivirus products, hey, look, look in that memory block, and the virus goes, uh, nope, I'm not there. And he goes, well, let's go. Oh, no, I'm not there either. So, hey, look, the queen, you know. And uh, it hides itself real well, which is why it's really required to use a clean boot disk or a clean boot sequence there. Polymorphic viruses are probably some of my favorites, which is really kind of a hypocritical thing for me to say because I really, it's one of those love-hate things. I love to hate viruses. Uh, polymorphic viruses are very tricky. They change the code every time they replicate. By changing their encryption code, they make it very difficult for removers to get rid of it. Antivirus software programs use a simulator to identify the code key and then use the key to remove the virus. Once again, it's like how they did with the monkey virus. They basically said, hey, we're going to infect XYZ file over here using like, you know, it's basically sandbox type technology. So everybody understand sandbox technology? Raise your hand if you don't. Yeah, I tricked some of you guys, yeah. Okay, sandbox technology, just to break the, the flow here, like I haven't done that all throughout the speech here, but what sandbox technology does is it acts like a DMZ on your system. It basically says, hey, look, we're going to isolate, who uses VMware? Okay, it's like a VMware. That system crashes, who cares? You know, and what the sandbox technology says is we're going to run it in an isolated sequence here, which will allow no damage to your system. So it says we're going to actually infect this you know, spook, uh, flo you know, floppy drive here, or, or this file here. And then what it does is it actually goes over there and starts doing the unencryption scheme, it looks for the code key, it'll stop it in its tracks and use that same code key because the code key changes each time. Well, since it never got to actually finish the replication process, that's going to be the code key. So it stops it in its tracks, backs up and says, hey, we're going to remove you. And it says, yeah, right. And it says, and we have this code key. And the virus goes, shit, damn, piss, hell, and out it goes. Uh, by changing their encryption code, they make it very difficult to remove and get rid of it. Antivirus software programs use a simulator to identify the code key and then use the key to remove the viruses. Like I said, this is a very, very cool technology. It's getting a lot more advanced now. I can't hear you at all. How do you know when to stop? I don't. The, the program does. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't write the program. So I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm, I'm sure it's on the net. My birthday is on the net. So I'm sure that's there too. <laughs> what? 
which one? Encrypting boot sector viruses. Encrypting viruses will encrypt data or themselves, making it more difficult to remove. They will also make it impossible to recover data without the virus to de-encrypt it. Once again, back to the monkey. Monkey really is my favorite virus. It's such a pain in the ass, it was very, very cool. Um, back in the olden days of the anti, of, of antivirus uh, rallies and stuff like that, back in like DOS, you know, before 6.2, <laughs> if anyone remembers back that far, aside from me, I'm so aging myself right now. Yeah, everybody who's shaking their head right now has gray hair like I do. Yeah, this is all out of a tube, buddy. You know, uh, there was a great boot sector virus called the Music Box or a Music uh, Music B or Music Virus. Anybody remember that virus? Raise your hand. Okay, this virus so rocked. It was so fun because what this virus would do is you'd be working on your DOS computer and you'd be moving around, right? And all of a sudden, your whole system would completely hang and your speaker would go, do, 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 And you're going, what the fuck? And everything would work fine again. And you're like, okay, okay, you know, it's late, I'm tired, you know, this game isn't working too well, you know, I bumped my head, you know, wife's slipping me weird shit in my coffee, what the hell, you know? And you'd be working again for a little while, and all of a sudden your system would hang. And you're like, okay, now I know I'm not imagining this. And you're looking at your computer, and you're waiting for like some sign. And you're like, what the hell? And it would do this randomly. Sometimes not for a week. Sometimes not for days. Sometimes every freaking minute. And then finally it would say, I'm done playing. Wipe out everything. Tried, not readable. Crash, boom, bam, out the door. It was a cool virus. I really, I, I respected the virus. It was very cool. Uh, very easy to remove. Very easy to remove. You know, uh, FD slash MBR, virus gone, game over. But that's just fun. Things that, things that fuck with the users were kind of fun. Up into the destructive part. Um, another virus like that was, uh, who remembers Rabbit? Mostly on the Macintosh. The old Max. No one remembers the rabbit. Oh come on! The guy with the gray hair and the receding hairline. You got to remember rabbit. <laughs> no. All right. Rabbit was cool. Rabbit would actually go from the Macintosh and use the Apple Link system, and then you would be working in your system, and this little rabbit would go bouncing across your screen, and then to the person next to you down the loop, and then the person next to you down the loop, and you would sit there going, hey, hey, "Huh? That's a newer version of it. They didn't have Energizer batteries back then." <laughs> I'm talking old. So this, huh? Yeah, they were called Ever Ready. <laughs> Just one bump. Yeah, it was a kind of a cool thing because you would sit there and you'd be working your cube and this thing would go zooming across you and like, hey, and then everybody else would be going, hey, hey. And, it was just, and, that, and that's all it did. It was harmless, but it, it was these little things that would mess with the users. Uh, and, and now we have window programs that do that, so. <laughs> Those are features. Yeah, there are no bugs in Windows. They're all features. Blue Screen of Death was designed specifically to give you a coffee break. Didn't you know that? You're working too hard. Let me just crash the system so you can take a break. <laughs> Encrypting boot sector viruses. Encrypting viruses will encrypt data or themselves making it... Do we do this? What are you doing? <laughs> File infector viruses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> User error. The beginning of the uh, virus code will point to the end of the file and the beginning of the real virus, putting this code into memory. So basically, you have the virus over here. It starts loading itself into memory, right? Jumps over to finish the, uh, the run at the end, and that loops over to the beginning of the actual virus file. These are really easy to identify because your file size gets big. Some of these were designed specifically to increase the, uh, the file size each time you ran the program. Who remembers those? Okay, who right now can tell me the maximum size of a com file? Oh, you're scaring me now. 64K. Yeah. So if you have a one meg com file, this would be bad, right? <laughs> what if your com file was like 10 gigs? <laughs> that would be really bad. Well, some of these files were designed to say, hey, if you got any executables or any com files, every time they're run, Let's increase the size expeditiously. <laughs> so you're sitting there going, I've got three programs on my system and the drive is full. What is wrong with this? Well, this is one of them. Yeah, you didn't update the fat. Yeah. 
File infected virus, the end of the virus code, yeah, 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 we did that. All right. <laughs> multi-parti viruses. The multi-parti virus will infect both the boot sector and files. Doesn't care, wants to hit both. This problem increases the spreading capabilities of the virus by disk, email, or other ways to remove the file. So what happens is this, if you ever access a drive, if you ever access any executable file, spread. Made it really, really easy for the virus to just spread like gangbusters, you know, just go everywhere. Macroviruses. The macrovirus writer uses a basic computer language included with Word and Excel to create the virus. You just got to love the guys. Several of the macroviruses use the normal dot dot file. Whenever you create an, uh, uh, a new document, it uses the standard template of the normal dot dot. So the virus writers were actually saying, let's replace that file with our virus code. So whenever you create a new doc or an Excel spreadsheet, you're creating it with a brand new virus each time. And then when you hand it to somebody else, they'll open it and then it'll look through and replace the, dat, uh, the normal dot dot file, which means is whenever you open any of your docs or Excel spreadsheets, they're automatically infected. This made it really easy for it to spread really, really fast. One of the interesting ones was the rainbow uh, macrovirus. Anybody remember that one? Okay. Uh, one of the interesting things with Rainbow was is Rainbow would just randomly start changing colors of things, like your background and desktop, you know, wallpaper information. So you'll get your like drop-down headers and, and the boxes and all that, all different colors. Everybody's seen the color schemes on Windows, right? Raise your hand, because everybody's at least had one job where they made you use the damn thing, right? Well, you know, you'll start booting Windows or using things, and they'll start changing colors on you. You're like. That's not the color scheme. I, I, I didn't choose pews. I'm very confident on this. You know, and baby shit yellow is not my favorite color. But that becomes interesting up until the time when it says, just make all the colors black. Or let's make all the colors white. And then you're like, OK, now we have an issue. <laughs> is, we'll just do the background. We'll just do everything black. Icons, everything black, 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 black. Not a pleasant situation. Um, very, very popular virus. Somewhat harmless. It really didn't have a payload. It was just a pain in the butt. Not too hard to uh, remove. The easiest way to remove these is to get a fresh normal dot dot file uh, and replace it. Or delete it and let it recreate one. What is a Trojan horse? A program or a piece of code that appears to be legitimate but actually has a hidden, oftentimes malicious purpose. Trojans do not replicate but can be parasitic. A really popular one was whack-a-mole. Do you remember whack-a-mole? Raise your hand. How many of you activated whack-a-mole because someone sent it to you in email and played it for hours? Just me? Yeah, great, just me. Thank God it was not my computer. <laughs> You know, you get it from a friend and say, dude, killer game, play this. And you double click it, and it was actually a game of whack-a-mole. And you play it, and it was, hey, this kicks ass. Some of the versions actually had Bill Gates' head. <laughs> it was like, bam, 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 this really kicks ass. And then weird things happen to your computer, and it's like, well, it doesn't kick an ass anymore, it's kicking my ass. <laughs> Trojan Hearse, these are programs that are put on your system by someone or you are tricked into activating them yourself. Most often these are backdoor programs like BO, BO, 2K, Netbus, etc. Um, there's a lot of different, actually, pro, uh, a lot of different programs out there that which are like Trojan generators, where it'll sit there and say, what is the actual executable you want, you know, that you want to use? What program that you actually, legitimate program do you want to use? Like Whack-A-Mole or um, any type of like solitaire game or whatever. And then it says, what Trojan do you want to put in there? You know, like BO2K, Netbus, whatever you want. And then it combines it into one executable. And then you send that off to somebody. And he said, hey, check out this game called Whack-A-Mole. Or, hey, check out this, uh, this new solitaire game. And it's the real program. But as you double click on it and run it, it now loads the Trojan on your system. How's that for fun? Nimda. This is uh, Marty's baby here, so I'm going to let him talk about Nimda a bit. Is that live? Yeah. Yeah, Nimda was uh, 
extremely successful and probably one of the most well-known of the uh, hybrid viruses uh, because of media coverage and because of its uh, high propagation rate. It used uh, multiple methods of getting into uh, networks. Uh, for instance, uh, the first method was uh, email. It, was, uh, it would arrive as an executable, but if you had, let's say, uh, mail scanning software, virus scanning software, you could block these executables uh, coming in without actually you know, putting up uh, or doing it that way. Uh, but one of the most interesting ways of uh, its propagation was infecting web servers. And it did this by looking for vulnerable IIS servers, 4.0 and 5.0, and also personal web servers. It would find these, uh, these servers and uh, run an exploit on them and uh, infect the HTML files on the web server. Now, this is interesting because there's also uh, vulnerability in Internet Explorer 5 through 5.5 that allowed the, uh, the run, running of arbitrary code, uh, MIME encoded code. So it would, uh, it would attach its, its, its MIME uh, code to the, to the bottom of the web page, and then a person would browse the web page, and then the machine would become infected, and then it would start to beacon and infect other machines. Once the machines were infected, they would search the local's user drives and also map drives looking for Word documents. This is the Trojan part, um, which, is, which is, I think was pretty, was pretty slick. Uh, it would look for Word documents or anything that uh, used rich text like uh, WordPad or Word, and it would drop a Trojan copy of Rich Ed 20 uh, DLL. And uh, what happens is on network shares, if a user that's not infected executes this document, first thing it does is look for Rich Ed 20 DLL to run. It has the worm code in it and then infects the user. And again, they start to beacon and propagate through the network and through the uh, internet. One of uh, NIMDA's strengths, which is the, the mass, pro you know, it's, it's, it's it's broadcasting uh, and, and searching for vulnerable web servers is also its weakness because it was soon tracked on the, uh, on the Internet. Um, if you've ever been to incidents.org, uh, if you've never been there, I'd recommend going. It's, it's a good site. They were heavily tracking it. Uh, and then, obviously, companies got wise and started using their IDS systems to track this activity to uh, disconnect infected subnets. So that's it. All right, virus evolution. New methods of virus writing are emerging all the time. Some new forms of malicious code have the ability to change themselves to evade detection. 1981, the first known virus, Mac OS. 1986, first known MS-DOS virus. 1988, encrypted viruses came out. Uh, 1997, uh, ugly morphic viruses. 1998, polymorphic viruses. 2000, metamorphic viruses. Keeping count, antivirus software vendors identified 1,000 new viruses last year, bringing the total to 71,000 known worldwide viruses. There are no super questions. How could there be a, um, there be a Mac virus three years uh, before the NOS is released? That Lisa. Wasn't, that, wasn't, that, that wasn't the Mac OS. It was, uh, 80, it was uh, 83 or 84. The, the Lisa was actually the predecessor to the Macintosh. It was the same type of OS, the exact same type of OS. The Macintosh was the upgraded version of the Lisa. This is when they were uh, moving away from the Apple II family. So when people are still using the Apple II GS, the Apple IIe, the Apple II Cs, and all that stuff, the next revolution, the Lisa, which was probably the most unsuccessful computer ever devised, was actually the predecessor to the we know nowadays Macintosh. Um, I hate to say this, but I used to wear a T-shirt that used to say, "Friends don't let friends buy Mac." Um, and now that we have OS 10, which is based on FreeBSD and actually gives you a CLI, damn it, buy a Mac. Um, if anyone's ever actually uh, wondering what a metamorphic virus is, polymorphic viruses change portions of their code, their encrypting keys and all of that stuff, each time they replicate. The metamorphic viruses actually change the code structure. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Okay, let me explain this. If I only change portions of my code, I can still maintain a signature for the antivirus products to remove, okay? 
I'm only changing encrypting codes. I'm only changing uh, files, uh, file information, okay? And, and, and my encrypting keys. If I actually change the whole code structure, like a metamorphic virus does, it's almost impossible to maintain a signature for an antivirus product to remove. Very, very difficult. There was an article, I can't remember, I wish I could. There was an article that was in one of the tech things where they were actually talking to anti antivirus products and they're saying we need to rewrite, you know, or reinvent the wheel when it comes to antivirus products because the viruses that are coming out now and the ones that are coming out in the future don't follow the same rules that we've been using in the past. So the engines that we're running, you know, they've been running for like years now are almost completely useless. Um, what's a good example of metamorphic? Zperm. Which one? Zperm A. Yeah, Zperm A. Zperm. It used uh, jump insertion um, and filled the body. Uh, filled, it, it used uh, jump insertion and filled the body with uh, junk code. Uh, this way, it avoided detection. Yes. The watch one? O oligomorphic. Yeah. Oligomorphic, you want to give me a description? Oh, oligomorphic uh, was their uh, first attempt. Uh, when they first uh, had encryption, encrypted viruses, they used a, a, a static decryption key, which antivirus vendors soon you know, put that into their, uh, into their signatures. Into the signature uh, bonds. Oligomorphic had the ability to use up to 64, I think, uh, it was like 64 different encryption keys that rotated them randomly. So it was another way for them to uh, avoid detection. Yeah, so, so where the virus file was, it was using or looking for a specific encryption key, by changing the encryption key, it wouldn't find the virus. Okay. Fakes and false alarms. All right, before we get into fakes and false alarms, one of the interesting things that a lot of the virus writers are using, especially for backdoors and Trojans, is they're using uh, different types of compression programs. Um, there's several uh, compression programs you can get on the internet for free. And what they do is they compress an executable into another executable. Now, normally, if you use like an executable zip program or whatever, the antivirus product will still identify it and remove it because when you activate it, it un uncompresses and actually runs the code. What these files do is they actually compress into a brand new executable and it doesn't un uncompress when it executes. So you can take uh, BO2K, compress it once, and it's a whole new file. And it'll go right through antivirus products. Well, fine, we'll just create a signature for that. Okay, well, let me compress it three times. Brand new executable. Fine, make another one. All right, I'm going to do it 64 times. Now, it's almost impossible because I have to have a DAT file for like from one to a thousand different types of compressions. Well, great, that works for that one program, but what, what about another one that does compression with a different algorithm? So what people are doing is your antivirus product will be up to date. Every antivirus product right now can block you know, BO2K. I mean, if you have it on there, it's going to see it, it's going to stop it. Well, what these compression programs do, it makes it impossible for these antivirus products to see it because it's not the signature base. So right now, I could send you a file that's compressed once or twice or three times. You could execute it on your system, and I can infect you with BO2K. And you could have DAT files that were updated this morning, and it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. It's too late. All right, when it comes, ah, go back. <laughs> fakes and false alarms. All right, most fakes and false alarms are spread through email. What? Anybody? Bjorn? Whatever. All right. All right, look for lots of bangs on your email header, you know, and read this in capitals, you know. When you see something that says read this and it's followed by, you know, bang, 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 all right, I'm telling you right now, if anybody in this room ever forwards an email that they get from this, I will find you. I will. One way or the other, I will track you down. And you will buy me a beer. My, my favorite is uh, the most destructive virus ever. ever. <laughs> <laughs> this virus is amazing. Not only will it delete your hard drive, but it will delete the hard drive in the other room. 
It will mow your lawn. It, your wife will get pregnant. Your virgin daughter will get pregnant. Your dog will be pregnant. You know? um, also, you know, when you start seeing things like, Microsoft says this is the most destructive virus it's ever seen. Microsoft doesn't really give out virus warnings. I'm sorry. Um, it was like, McAfee says that it's impossible to remove. Well, first of all, when you see something where it says any type of antivirus product says that it cannot remove the virus, what antivirus company would ever make a statement like that? We can't handle it. We have no clue. Better buy somebody else. We don't know what they're doing. <laughs> We're clueless. Well, that's true, but that's not the reason why they're clueless. But uh, we won't go there. So be careful. Realistically, this becomes a virus. Think about it. A virus's job is to replicate and spread as fast as it can everywhere it can. It does not have to be destructive. If I have an address book of 400 billion people and I send this to them, I've replicated this to everybody. Spam is one of the biggest freaking viruses ever developed. And if I get one more piece of marketing material from some bastard and they're like, hi, I'm Cindy. Want to see my tits? <laughs> yeah. It makes you just want to slap somebody or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. VBS Visual Basic Scripts. Every damn script kitty in the world can now write viruses. The I Love You Virus was one of these. Now, the first time I gave this lecture, I had a seven-year-old boy in the background. He raised his hand. He goes, you spelled damn wrong. It's like, I am very well of how I spell damn. It's spelled there. It's supposed to be a joke. Here's the, here's the key here. If you get the joke, cool. If you don't get the joke, don't ask me. You need to figure it out yourself. It's not that difficult. But I can tell you right now, those of you who have not gotten the joke are going to be up tonight going, what the hell did he mean by damn? Uh, it could be. Um, the I Love You virus is, is a really good example. It took basic exploit capabilities. It was written in VBS scripts. It spread like wildfire. It covered everybody. Who here was actually in, or worked at a company that was infected by uh, the I Love You virus? Raise your hand. If you, were actually, if you were working at a company or you yourself were infected by the I Love You virus. Most of us were. Most of us were. Oh, the, I like that. His security manager got it and forwarded it to the company. <laughs> Is he still working there? At a Cordicova. <laughs> you know, I, I knew I was pretty close to my boss, but I wasn't that close. God, I hope my wife doesn't see this one. You know, when I had emails sent to me from the secretary, which I could understand, but I mean, from like the president of the company and my manager, the trash lady, Jose, who, uh, you know, does the shipping, you know, I love you, man. I, look, I mean, I'm a nice guy, but that's pushing it, you know? I knew something was wrong. Now, the interesting thing about the I love you virus and stuff like this is these cannot really be detected because you don't have the upper data files. How do you protect yourself from malicious and hostile code? How do you protect yourself when you surf a website and you get nailed by a JavaScript or an ActiveX you know, script? Aside from actually running a Unix program, you know, OS. Uh, you can. You could turn it off. You can turn it off in the web browsers. You can turn off ActiveX and Java. But there's a lot of places you need to go sometimes that require ActiveX and Java. So you can actually set them up to say, in, uh, request my permission before you run any of these codes. You know, or try, I like this. Uh, don't you love the little thing you get in the Windows? It's like, you know, hey, we're trying to give you this. And it has a little click. But always trust Microsoft. Oh, yeah, I'm checking that box right now. I'm clicking OK right here, buddy. Yeah, yeah. And the check's in the mail, and I won't, uh, never mind. Um, but you really need to defend yourself against halts of code. There are programs out there right now that use the sandbox technology to actually protect you from malicious code. Now, these programs are not designed to replace your antivirus product. 
They're designed to work in conjunction with your antivirus product because they don't uh, remove the, the virus, they stop malicious activity. There's a couple different programs out there that do that. Hostile code. Everything we talked about is considered hostile. So what this, you know, what's the deal here? New and undiscovered, uh, undiscovered uh, hitting the wild, Java, ActiveX, other crap. How the hell do you defend against new hostile code? Use your brain. That doesn't always work because your brain was your worst enemy. Huh? That's before beer. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, it's amazing how much you actually do when you've had like a case of jolt. Defending against hostile coding. Setting the public security settings on your using, yes, this means your Unix systems as well. Yes, Unix systems are now under attack by viruses and Trojans. Yes, having a Unix system doesn't mean you're 100% safe. Anyone in this room who actually thinks that because they're running Linux, they are completely 100% safe, I need to drag your ass over to the, you know, the capture the flag area right now. I don't care how locked down your box is. I don't care you know, how many IDS systems you have on that system. It is still able to access if you know what you're doing. One of the theories that are running around in some of the virus areas is what about having a virus that looks to a secret FTP server for new vulnerabilities, loads and updates itself, and then goes out and tries to attack web servers that may have this vulnerability or workstations on the internet. Now that we all have DSL and cable modems and we're on 24 seven, this makes it really, really easy. Now I want you to really think about that for a moment. Imagine a virus who looks for new exploits. What about the exploits that aren't, aren't released to the wild, to you guys? I mean, you guys do know that when a hacker crew releases an exploit, they've had it for months, right? That they just didn't discover it that day and release it, right? Most of these are released to the vendor months before it's released to the wild. Sometimes out of courtesy. courtesy. Sometimes because it's just a book in the eye. I know people who have vulnerabilities to different operating systems, FreeBSD, Solaris, Linux, Windows, that they've never released to anybody that they use daily that still have not been discovered. So what if you had a virus that would look for these at secret locations and then hit your system and you couldn't defend against it? How many people right here are just a little twinged on that? Just a little scared? Well, you should be. The future hostile code is pretty astronomical. Don't even get me started on cyber terrorism. That's another hour talk. What these programs do is they use the sandbox technology. Okay? The programs look for hostile activity on your systems, stop it in its tracks, and give you a warning. Uh, a good example is there's a program called Finch and Surf and Shield. Okay? Um, it's a good product. I use it on my systems too. Uh, and it works in conjunction with your, your, your products. No, I'm not a rep. I don't get kickbacks. I get no money from them. It's just a good product. Sandbox, uh, sandbox uh, I'll learn how to talk. Sandbox technology, how does it work? What about dat file updates? A great app to use with Finch and Surf and Shield. No, I don't get kickbacks, told you. Here's a website. Contact Dan uh, Danny Nelson, she's a sales rep. She works with me a lot. Um, it's, I'm trying to get it for uh, the company I work for right now. Um, the thing with uh, Finch and software is it doesn't use dat files. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. What it does is it looks for hostile activity. Once again, this works in conjunction with your antivirus product. If you get an ActiveX, any, or here's a good example. When the I Love You virus hit the wild and spread across the United States in like, you know, under a couple hours and infected thousands of systems, companies that actually were using the sandbox technologies were completely unaffected because it recognized it as hostile activity and stopped it in its tracks. This was before the DAT files were out. It took like two hours for some, uh, for some of the companies to get DAT files out for this. In two hours, your systems were hosed. Okay, so if you think in conjunction to the amount of downtime you're involved with, you really need to plan for hostile activity. If you take your salaries, if you have tech people, let's take an average salary of 60,000 a year, 
Okay, does everybody fear, think that's fair for, you know, uh, like mid to upper level techs? Yes? Thumbs up? Okay, so let's just take that as a number. I wouldn't take that as a salary, but that's just me. For 60 grand a year, if I have five techs, if it takes them one day to recover all my systems, they're now spent one day less working on their normal projects. I've lost money. If all my employees in my company cannot operate because their systems are down, I still have to pay their salaries. Now I've lost a lot of money. They say it takes on the average, I think it was like for a large company of like a couple hundred employees, something in the round of like $250,000 a day to recover if they're not working. That's natural disasters and hostile activity. So that's it. That's my talk. Thank you very much for coming out. I'd like to thank uh, my partner, Marty, here. Marty helped me out with a lot of the slides, and we've been working back and forth. We both lectured together at H2K2, um, and we're working on a new advanced antivirus product talk for next year. Uh, the next talk, this is the last year this talk will ever be uh, spoken. Uh, the next talk will be um, advanced with actual samples of code and explaining how the code is actually operating. So questions? Would Zone Alarm Pro help or ABP? Zone Alarm Pro help or, uh, or, or programs like that? Yes and no. Those help against some things, but not hostile activity directly on the system uh, from malicious code. It's a different process. Which one? TDS. I'm actually not familiar with that product, so I, I'm not sure. Which one? I haven't seen it. Do you have an opinion on Kaspersky Labs antivirus software product? Mm -hmm. um, actually, I haven't used it. I haven't seen it. So. <laughs> yeah, on the, on a lot of uh, CPU cycles. No, you know, I'll, I'll flat out tell you right now. I've, I've been dealing with computer viruses for a lot of years. I, I have never, ever written a virus. Doesn't mean I can't. It's just part of my moral uh, fibers. I can't come out here and preach antivirus and actually produce them myself. I refuse. I, I won't be a hypocrite. I can tell you right now, there is no antivirus project out there right now who will write or create or work with anybody who works, uh, who's ever written a virus. Um, McAfee has actually escorted people out the door for admitting that they've written a virus. You know, you don't even get to pick up your shit. We'll mail it to you. They will escort you out the door. The reason being for that is if you work for an antivirus company or any antivirus companies, if they ever, ever was discovered they released a virus, the company would be out of business immediately. Either way. No, they won't even do it. They won't do it. They can't. They can't. The company would be folded in 24 hours. So a lot of companies are like, well, you know, so-and-so, I know they write viruses. I can tell you right now. I, I've worked at several antivirus companies. No, they never write viruses. They had, I was over at McAfee, and they, they wanted to hire this engineer who was phenomenal. The guy was great. They were just like sweating bullets. They were going like, to offer him the moon. And, and they asked the question, hey, have you ever written a virus? He goes, yeah, I've written two or three. And everybody's heads at the table went, oh, sh we can't hire you. We can't. Well, it was early on in my college years. I don't do it now. He goes, we can't hire you. We can't have anybody here ever who's ever written a virus and as a matter of fact we have to escort you out right now and they did they brought him up they brought in security and they escorted him right to the door yeah they're really stringent on that so um i went to lunch with the guys and i was sitting there and they're talking about like yeah you know john mcafee you know it's like uh, it was the michelangelo that basically put uh, you know mcafee on the map man that's really what launched the company and i was kicking back at lunch with a bunch of the guys i said yeah great how long did it take john to write it dead silence they were glaring at me. They're going, we don't even fucking joke about that. I was like, wow, I've been here two days. I'm almost fired.
I mean, they were really pissed. They said, don't you ever even joke about that. Um, McAfee really, I mean, I can tell you right now, McAfee takes it really, really serious. So does Symantec. With the code blue virus, was it basically just a copy of code red with a different attack point, or was there anything else unique about it? That's a long discussion. And that's something that we can kick back over a beer sometime and talk. Yeah, um, yeah, there was differences, but it, once again, it was basically someone based off another technology running back in. It's, it's like the second version of the uh, I Love You virus. You know, it's like, hey, we'll take the basic concept and we'll just throw new packages on. But it did add some other new features, so it, that's... It, it's kind of an interesting discussion. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, what, what's the policy with uh, uh, politics behind antivirus software deciding what to look for, for example, uh, keyboard sniffers or uh, other spyware, whether it be government or otherwise? Uh, basically, in a nutshell, the, the attitude is how fast can this replicate? How relevant is it in the wild? Um, if they feel that it's actually in the wild right now or it will be in the wild very soon and it's going to replicate real fast and spread, then they put it in DAT files. Thousands of viruses written aren't in DAT files anymore. There's viruses that were in DAT files years ago that aren't in DAT files now because those viruses only worked on specific versions of the OS, of specific OS systems. There's some viruses that were in DAT files that you will never see again because they only worked on DOS 5.0 systems. So it, it's de you have to keep the DAT files downloadable. So that's what they do. Yeah, one more question. About uh, uh, sandboxing and them detecting uh, hostile activities, what does this program define as hostile? How do you define hostile activity? Basically, a hostile activity is anything that, uh, if it's going to replicate or play something on the system that it considers hostile, changing the kernel code, you know, um, sending out email without permission, opening up other applications. These can all be ascertained as hostile activities because it looks for specific things that hostile activity is doing now and looks for that type of a replication capabilities. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys coming out.